coming down. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Rich. I think, how are things in Cashers? Well, I'm in Central right now, but I'm gonna go up to Cashers tomorrow to take down Christmas and maybe see some snow Thursday and or Friday. Wow. Yeah. I think, snowman. <laughs> I think I'll stay inside. <laughs> That that's in the forecast, and we may get some here in in central. You know, in the foothills of South Carolina, we we may get a, get a little bit, but I don't see that in the forecast. But it's definitely in the forecast for Cashers and Lake Toxaway. That's where my place is. Hey, Ginger. Hello, Laura. How are you? Today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. That's good to hear. Yeah, it is. It's a nice day, just a little cool. Yes. <laughs> Mary and I went and got our COVID-19 shots yesterday. Good for you. So we're, Great. We're, How we're long before you get the second one? Is? Did they say how long before you get to your second dose? Yeah. Uh, three weeks. Three weeks, okay. And then after that, it takes a couple of weeks to really be effective and feel safe now. I don't know. Yeah, I had just read that in the paper today. Um, but each day, you know, after you get that second one, each day you're, um, you're stronger in, in fighting it. So. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I haven't heard when I might be able to get mine, um, but I'll wait my turn. I'm. 71 so we'll see but i'm pretty much in isolation here so <laughs> let people who are out and about get it well, good morning rob. Good morning, everybody. good morning morning rob how are things down your way rich <clears throat> very nice I would just tell them that we proved that Mary and I got our uh, COVID-19 inoculations yesterday. All right. Which one, which version did you get, Moderna or Pfizer? Pfizer. Pfizer is the RNA uh, and the uh, Moderna, uh, what, what, what Moderna is uh, a DNA. And the doctors I've talked to seem to think that the uh, there's less of a problem with the with the rna the pfizer so that's why we went with that very that's good what, that was what they were offering so then <laughs> <laughs> that's good too that's right it's nice to have the offer are you feeling okay after the shot the little soreness in the place a little, the injection a little sore in the arm where, where they shot it but not you know like you normally would get from any flu shot look that's a little local Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Hey there, Margaret. Hey, Laura. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Hey, Ginger, Laura. Good morning, Laura. <laughs> Rich and everyone. Good morning. Laura, you forecast for some snow down in South Carolina, too? Yes, but I'm coming up to the mountains tomorrow. So I I don't miss it there. I have to take down right, Christmas. You know, uh, <laughs> it's a yeah, that's so it's time to take it down up there. But you know, John and I were up there for Christmas, and we just left everything. So it it'll wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> Clean floors it'll and wait. enjoy some snow. It'll wait. Yeah, a little bit of ours is waiting on us too. Well, it's a little after 10, and I think it's good for us to begin. The Lord be with you. With thy spirit. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, 
visit us daily through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may open our hearts and minds to your love and to your will, and then guide our feet and our hands in the ways of peace and obedience and faith. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we are um, in the lectionary cycle. There's the first Sunday after Christmas. There's a second Sunday after Christmas. Somewhere in there, there is the, an epiphany of the sixth. And then after the epiphany, after the Feast of the Epiphany, every year, uh, this year, January the 10th, the readings are about the baptism of Jesus. And so we have a lot of Holy Spirit imagery uh, or even content in the story of the Holy Spirit, uh, as well as things about baptism uh, to, to go in line with all that. And in the sense that baptism is about new birth and new beginning, it makes sense that, you know, for Jesus, this is new beginning for him too, uh, in the sense of maybe it's our awareness of him, and that's what's really beginning. But it's, it's sort of officially seen as the beginning of his adult ministry, at least in this instance. Sometimes the wedding in Cana of Galilee is seen that way if, if you're looking through the lens of the Gospel of John. But a, a lot of it for Matthew and Mark and Luke has to do with this moment, his baptism in the River Jordan, which we heard some about in Advent, of course, because we were studying about John the Baptist himself. But now this passage is expanded from what we read before to include more about Jesus and his ministry and what's going on. So interestingly enough, and as I, as I share my screen in this, the, um, the first reading are the very first words of the Bible itself, uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. And that's right there. Laura, if I could get you to read that, please, Laura. Okay. okay. A reading from Genesis 21. I'm not sure why I'm getting the feedback. Maybe somebody else should. I'm gonna, that's okay. Try it again. I, I put on the mute and that helped. Okay. A reading from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be God. God. So the the uh, the translation of the word Genesis is in the beginning, just like we say the Genesis of something that's happened in the beginning of something. That that's the the translation of that. So we really are each of those books of the Old Testament, the first five uh, are really the first word that is there in, in scripture one way or another. Uh, and there are, are plenty of creation stories uh, around in different cultures, different places. Uh, and this is, this is the one that we understand and believe as um, Judeo-Christian folk. And that God was creating, in a sense, out of nothing. It's, it, some people dispute that even in the Christian world, uh, that the earth was a formless void. And that would mean that it's really just nothing. It's a void with no form. And so creating out of nothing, ex nihilo, is sometimes what's that called. But then all of a sudden, darkness is covering something, the face of the deep. So maybe there wasn't a void, or it only seemed to be a void because of the absence of light. And this, of course, this idea of light and let there be light, the first day, the first thing that God created ties into other themes when we get to Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world, or Jesus saying to the disciples, you were salt and light, or the gospel of John, it's prologue, the light was coming into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. Uh, 
that gospel actually starts with in the beginning as well. And it's in a, really a, a true editorial spiritual attempt to talk about how Genesis is the one layer and John and Jesus uh, are the second layer. But in John also, the author John is talking about Jesus pre-existing everything, even the light itself. And so that is a significant thing to think of in terms of what gets created first. Well, Jesus was there before God said, let there be light. The spirit was there before God said, let there be light. And this, uh, this wind here, the term in the Hebrew text is ruach, which often talks about wind. It's that same type of wind or breath, as Ezekiel talks about the dry bones that are breathed into those bones. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's something about this breath of life, this wind, that thematically and symbolically is, is very important. And so you have at this moment then the, the Father and the Holy Spirit involved in the act of creation. And God said, let there be light. Now you'll realize and that, that this is not saying I'm going to create a sun or there's a burst. The light is not from any, any kind of planet or any kind of thing that we would look up in the skies and see. The light is separate from that because it's on day four that he said it's a, a sun in the sky and the moon in the sky. So this is different. And that's always been something that's very curious for me as a son of a scientist. Uh, and I see, you know, creation being very important and it will be very pragmatic. One thing has to come before the other, but spiritually speaking, um, light is the first thing that is here. And God liked the light. He called it good and separated the light from the darkness. Called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning on the first day. Rob? Yes. I think it, if you read it, reading the words, it says, <coughs> in the beginning when God created, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void. If this doesn't describe the Big Bang, I don't know what does. It is, I mean, this is right. It just, the, the discoveries today just say that all of this was so correct that, uh, it, and, it, and it just, as it, as it goes on. <coughs> Sorry about that, Rich. Get yourself a sip of water, but you're right. Again, as the son of a scientist and the, the Big Bang Theory, I, I don't see how these are polar opposite descriptions, that they are um, in some ways concurrent. They're not saying exactly the same thing, but thematically, and you can see how there is some synchronicity between them. It shows here that God is not just creating the earth, but that God is also creating the heavens. And when we think about that, maybe the first thing we think about are the planets and stars and solar systems and galaxies and other things that now that we see that are out there. Uh, or maybe this is talking about the, that the dwelling place of angels and archangels the dwelling place of those who've gone before us now, the dwelling place of Christ, that the heavens may be more of a spiritual place than a something in, in time and space made of matter, uh, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, all those, all those things. So it's, again, I think there's a both and in that. If we're looking for complete harmony between our scientific understanding and the biblical understanding we're really just not going to find it. But if we are looking for synchronicities, things where they match up and don't provide this very, very troublesome contradiction, then I, I agree with Rich in this, is that we, 
we have something that's very much like the Big Bang Theory. Rob, Rich probably knows that uh, this verse uh, refers to what God did on the first day. And uh, some people uh, say, well, what did God do after that, uh, after he did that? And Rich probably knows that God said, well, I'm going to call it a day. <laughs> Very true. I like that one. Thank you for filling in for, for Rich on that one. Rich, you're one behind in today's class. So just <laughs> for keeping score, I just got to know what's going on. Very good, Colin. Thank you. <laughs> well, this, uh, while we're on the joking side, um, this is why this passage is also, know, well, we know God is a baseball fan because he says in the big inning. Oh. oh. Uh, Oh. <laughs> oh boy it's contagious um, i'm telling you it's contagious <laughs> that's the right thing to be contagious versus this other stuff um so anyway the the idea here and and what i don't want to go into into genesis specifically or without looking at the other passages but what we're always seeing here is god speaking from heaven God naming things, day and night and light. And when we get to Jesus' baptism, we're all going to, so it's going to hear the voice of God from heaven. We're going to hear God naming things. Uh, we're going to hear God establishing something, um, a first of things in some ways, a first of a first day of restart, you might think of it. You might also think of the incarnation and all that as being the first and, and all of that, but this there is something happening in here that the lectionary people who you know who fashioned this together want us to see. And not just that they wanted us to see like they made it up, but they know the people of God had seen that. Jesus had talked about it, prophets had talked about it, and and they're really bringing it, bringing it forward, given the new understanding of who Christ is. So with that in mind, um, we'll go down here to the psalm. And Rich, if you've got your voice back, I'll turn to you and Mary. Y'all are good at that and to read this psalm for us. Hey, Mary, when we start? Yes. <clears throat> Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of, God, of the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the mm -hmm. Lord splits the flames of fire. The voices of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees rise and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. Thank you. Well, I think from a first read of this, it's not too far of a stretch why this psalm is chose to be paired with Genesis. Uh, with verse 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Obviously, the psalmist knew that part of Genesis and was recalling that. That the God, the God of glory thunders as upon the mighty waters. You know, there's a lot about the waters for us, even that we don't understand. Some people say we've explored space more than we've explored the ocean. Um, and for 
people early on, uh, hum humanity early on, and even in Jesus' time, the waters were a scary place. There were winds and storms. There were great creatures, leviathans. They didn't quite understand octopi and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And so um, when, you, when you think about Jesus stilling the waters and walking on the water, when you think about the voice of the Lord moving over the water to create something out of nothing, this is, this is part of what we are meant to all sort of collect in our minds and our heads as we hear about the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Chaos is being stilled. Order and power are coming. It's a mighty voice. It's a helpful voice. And so what do we, what do, we do when we hear the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice? I mean, how many times? I don't think even got all the times that it was repeated in this, in this psalm. Uh, in the transfiguration, we have this voice that comes from heaven. When we have the baptism, we have this voice that comes from heaven. And a lot of the end chapters of, of John are about listening to my voice. My, I am the good shepherd. My own know me. They listen to my voice. They follow me. It all really is, it is weaving this thread and continuing it through when we hear Christ, when we hear God's voice. What is it to listen to the voice, the powerful voice, a splendorous voice? Uh, it's so powerful it breaks cedar trees. And those are some of the, the deep winds. But sometimes it's that voice that says, you know, to Peter, you are the man. You know, you are the one that has betrayed me. And that's, a, that's not a, a good voice to hear. Here are a couple other voices that I missed in talking about that. We can understand some of this in seven and eight when the when the winds whip through cashers in the highlands and Cullowhee, um, it shakes the trees. <laughs> it makes the oak trees writhe. We, we understand that power and um, and how scary that is. In a, in a movie from, I think, the 90s or something like that, um, I for, even forget what, what it's called, but there's a, a singer, Alanis Morissette, who plays the character of God. And um, she doesn't speak out loud for much of this part of the movie. And it's, it's a little bit of a spoof. It's a little bit sacrilegious. Um, but when she does open her mouth, what comes out of her mouth is this, this voice, this voice, it's wind, this destruction, this awesome power. And so even in their, even in their humor and sacrilege, they capture the power of the, of the voice of God and, and what it does in creating something like light. Um, again, to think scientifically, when, uh, when there's nuclear fusion, when there an atomic bomb goes off, when there is a blast like that, there is this burst of light. There's the burst of lightning. It's powerful and things follow it. And so that's the, again, the power of light, the power of voice we're meant to understand here. And of course, I'm going Any to... Other... Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to come up with the one I like the best, nine. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. Yes. That's and a little better than, than crying OMG, you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> that is just, that is scared. That this is, no, yeah, this power is actually seen as, as something that brings glory. It brings all, it brings glory, it's majesty. And how and how wonderful it is. So there is, there is in this wonderment more than there is fear. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Mary. Thank you. And in verse eleven too, I mean that's very comforting. You know, he has all this power, but he gives strength to his people, and he gives his people the blessing of peace. That's a wonderful ending. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a comforting thought with the the virus too, and. You know, we're starting to get, get the strength and the blessing of peace because the McConnells have gotten their shots. <laughs> That's right. 
in verse 10, the word, the flood in Hebrew uh, is the word that describes the great flood. And this is another example of the psalmist uh, connecting back to Genesis and the story of the great flood. Yes, which then connects back to these first parts of Genesis where when the earth is just essentially covered with water, uh, it seems like it is a flood and that there's no land. There is just the water, a formless void. Um, and the flood is a sense going back to that moment and restarting, which is why water is important when we get to the baptism of Christ, not a devastating water that's covering the world, but actually a, a healing water that's covering and washing us of our sins. So there's a, there's a difference in that. Well, only one time, one time the, according to the current scientific theories, <clears throat> the earth was in fact covered with water and there was no land. Yes, continents have been shifting and moving, forming and sinking and all those things. It's a, uh, I find all that very, 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 very interesting. Ice ages, warm times, little ice age, like 200 years ago, there was a, it was the end of the little ice age. There was 200 years where the earth was a whole lot colder, a whole lot colder than it is now. And well, I, I remember that well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, a, when I was a kid, the earth was still flat. <laughs> Anything else on this song? All right, let's move on to Acts, and I'll blow this up a little bit here on my screen. Hopefully, it's blown up on yours so the print's a little bit bigger. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's, we, we move now more clearly into the theme of baptism. We're in Acts 19, which is a little more than halfway through. Um, and there are, there are mention in this time of other apostles doing good works. Uh, Paul is not the only one, you know, Paul traveled with Barnabas, Timothy, John Mark, Silas, those were some of his companions that we hear about a lot in his letters, Luke, Priscilla, Aquila. But we also hear in Acts of the Apostles of this person named Apollos. And I think you can tell by his name that he was of Greek heritage. Um, and the fact that he is in Corinth, that is a Greek town. So the, basically the sentence starts with, while Apollos was in Greece, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Turkey or was in Turkey, what we call Turkey now. And so they were really a continent apart, even though in terms of distance, it wasn't that great a distance, but they were in different places. Apollos as a little more of a latecomer to the faith um, uh, was known for his good preaching. He was, he was good at that. Maybe just his, his training had been in rhetoric more. Some people actually credit Apollos of having written uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Hmm. Others think that's not that likely since he was Greek and this is to the Hebrews. Others think that Barnabas was a more likely author of that, but uh, it's one of those contested letters where things like Romans is really not contested on the academic world. Um, some of the other ones doesn't sound like all the rest of Paul's language and how he did it. A lot of that I attribute to the fact that sometimes Paul was dictating and somebody else was writing. And if you've ever done that, you know, other people's words or syntax slip into to all that kind of thing if you're dictating a, a long letter. But anyway, uh, they are friends, but there is in the early church some discrepancy um, about baptism and what's complete or not based on this. If someone has or has not received the Holy Spirit. 
you remember when Peter goes to baptize Cornelius, um, they receive the Holy Spirit. A lot of these baptisms, they actually have the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. There are some outward and visible signs. So this passage has to do with the fact that Apollos and others had really been living more into the baptism of John rather than the baptism that Jesus would talk about later, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, at this point, um, Laura Flaherty, if you wouldn't mind reading this passage for us. Sure. Acts 19, 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophecy. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> So you may remember some parts from the Gospel of John, obviously not written by John the Baptist, who had died before the resurrection and the crucifixion. Um, but part of what Jesus was saying is, I'm leaving you, but I'm going to send you an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will lead you into all truth. So this is the same concept here that Paul is trying to teach and, and this message to deliver, that the, that the Holy Spirit is a very important part of our life and of our faith and Paul would talk about it in other ways at other times being baptized and we are given different gifts by the spirit some tongues some knowledge some teaching and there's you know all those lists that come there these gifts that come through the power of the Holy Spirit so part of what this passage is also reemphasizing for us without using the word trinity is the sense of the, the need of the Trinity is equal with the Son and is equal with the Father in spiritual ways. Uh, what I've, the term I've used in this class before, um, or comparison of this, is they have the same DNA, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're a match. Um, where we do not have that, that divine. We may uh, have, uh, have a couple parts of it if we're made in the image of God, but they are all, there's an equality there that, that cannot be denied. Uh, there's not even a hierarchy, Father, then Son, and Spirit, but a, an equality and interweaving of the, of the three. So this passage in its own way acts to support that, acts to support our actual baptisms that we do when we say someone is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. And, and that part of the Holy Spirit being involved in our lives is very important. And it's sometimes, I think in the life of the church, unfortunately undersold. Maybe it's because evangelicals and people who speak in tongues and that kind of thing sometimes just doesn't, doesn't ring true to our personal experience, or maybe it does. Um, is, is that what it means to have the Spirit? Um, or is it, is it also something that it is not, um, we're not speaking in tongues. We didn't prophesy. And so that, that's hard too. So it's, I feel like if we're really baptized and we really have the Holy Spirit, we ought to be speaking in tongues. We ought to prophesy. But again, as Paul says in other places, not everybody has every gift. And, and some of those things just don't come to all of us. What other thoughts or questions do you have? What other insights on a close reading of this do you have?
I'd just like to emphasize what you just said at the end was that there are many different spirits. It's not all speaking in tongues. It shows that the Holy Spirit is active in your life, but teaching and reaching out to others is are other parts of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And many other things. Okay, then let's move on to uh, the gospel itself. Mark. As you can tell from the heading here, Mark 1, 4 through 11, we're almost at the very, very beginning of the gospel. I said it a number of times in this class. Mark does not have wise men or angels or Gabriel visiting Mary or Joseph in a dream and all of that. Mark starts the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He lays it right out there with who this story, what his good news is, is all about. And for him, it's Jesus' adult ministry and how it begins at this moment that is this, this beginning point. And so John the Baptizer, he's not even given the name as a title in there. Not John the Baptist appeared, but John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, just like Paul was saying. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is about the repentance of sin. Jesus said it in any number of other occasions. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out and were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Again, we read that in Advent. A lot of you were there for that class. Uh, again, the forgiveness of sins is part of what this is about. Then it talks more about John being clothed with a camel's hair, a leather belt, eating, eating locusts and wild honey, and then proclaiming the one who's more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with, guess what? The Holy Spirit. So there is our theme from Genesis to Acts, to Mark, this power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And we, we want it. We need it. And that is actually where our, pretty much where our lesson ended in Advent. And then we pick up this part. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Excuse me, not Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, but he was a Galilean and was baptized by John in the Jordan. It's actually where they think the baptism happened is a long way from Nazareth, probably a two days walk if you're walking all day to get there, maybe even longer than that. Uh, it would be you'd take that road, you'd go along the Jordan River, and then you would ascend from there up to Jerusalem. Uh, there's a way to go through the mountains, but it's a little more up and down, just like you know it would be if you walked from here to Highlands in a straight line versus finding a, a path. And this is where it, a close study of these baptismal stories from Matthew and from Luke and even from John differ just a little bit from each other in ways that are academically curious to me but they don't change the fact and the truth of the matter. Just as with Genesis, what happens the first day, the second day, the third day is academically interesting, but it doesn't change the basic premise is that God is the one who creates. This being different than the next version or the next version doesn't change the fact that at this moment of Jesus being baptized, there is something very powerful happening that the, all the gospelers want us to see and that really God wanted people to see those who had come out to see him. And why, where Mark is different is that if, if you read it one way, and I think you can read it this way pretty clearly, Jesus is the only one who witnesses these things that happen. He saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending on a dove on him. Then a voice came from heaven you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And so it is a much more personal endorsement from heaven. As I talked about with the Genesis, it's about God's voice 
It's about God naming something, God setting something apart as, as special and holy and blessed with you. I'm well pleased. He saw the light and he called it what? Good. So there is, there is happiness. There is joy from God. That The light is good. The sun is beloved. The sun makes God pleased. And, you know, that's always nice for kids to hear from their parents. I'm pleased with you. That's a good thing that's happening or we're pleased with our friends and, and all of that. But this, this kind of endorsement, as it's written, is one of the things that may have solidified in Jesus. Okay, I had thought this for a long time. My mama told me stories. I had had this connection. You can imagine it. But then all of a sudden, this voice comes from heaven and says this. Then Jesus is ready to go. With Luke and Matthew, it's a little more of a public pronouncement. This is my son. In other words, the crowd is meant to see it, to witness it, and the epiphany is theirs as much as it is Jesus. But this, this particular version, the epiphany, is for Jesus, and then, of course, for the reader. Anyone who reads this gospel is realizing these, these things are happening. Hmm. Well, Rob, you just mentioned it a little bit, but I've always wondered then, when did Jesus actually know who he truly was? You know, it's just, it's from a child. Or... Right, right. Um, and maybe there were some other things early on. Uh, we have very, very, very few details of those first three decades of his life. Uh, even his, we get preteen stuff, but you know, from a teenager on, uh, we just we don't we don't know. How did he know? When did he know? Was it fully known? Was it eighty percent at this point, and then it grew to ninety, and then it grew to a hundred? Uh, all those things are are. I'm interested in those. I'm curious about those, but we do not get definitive answers from Scripture when we, if we're looking for them, in on that. But I would say, if you didn't know it at this point, Jesus, you're never going to know it, because <laughs> this is, this is, this is, this is pretty clear. The heavens are torn apart, and when you think about what that might have been that he would have seen, you know, we we get that a little bit. Remember the stoning of Stephen in Acts of the Apostles? He's down on his knees. He looks up to heaven, and all of a sudden, he sees God and Jesus at his right hand, and he proclaims that, and people are saying blasphemy how can you see into heaven what what's all going on with that um and it is some sense that the that the heavens are something that has it's almost a surface as a covering that you could tear it open like you could tear open a a shirt or a piece of cloth or whatever else that that type of tearing open and, and get through to it and this is this is part of what mark wants us to hear he saw the heavens torn apart. Other, other questions or thoughts on this passage? Well, you know, when we do a baptism here, I know Lord of Flaherty knows this. We, I have a little bit of Jordan River water that I pour in with the cashers water in part just to remember um, this and, and to connect those baptisms to people being baptized here. The Baptist in this particular uh, report is making sure that the people around understand the relationship of John to Jesus and that Jesus was so f far more powerful that John wouldn't even be uh, considered appropriate to untie the thong of Jesus's sandals, which was normally the job of a slave who would then wash the feet of the uh, person whose sandals were removed in the process of receiving that person into 
uh, the home. And it's interesting that that process includes also water and a washing and a, clean, mm -hmm. and a, clean, and a cleansing, if you will. Yeah. Right. And it's important for us to not just know Jesus, but to receive Jesus and to have Jesus come in as opposed to keeping Jesus, you know, bound up in our Bibles and on our Sundays or in our worship services, but to right. have Jesus become a, a, a major part of our lives. Yes. Amen. And, and then, amen. And then when we are, when, when Paul calls us heirs of the kingdom, we are not son in the divine way, but we are sons and daughters of Christ. I mean, daughters of the king is uh, the, one of the names of our uh, very faithful and good group of prayer and service that we have here. And so we are uh, Henry Nowen, who did a lot of writing, wants us as Christians to remember that God is also, particularly at our baptism, saying, with you, I am well pleased. And just as Colin was saying about the cleansing the factor of the water, uh, water in Genesis is part of creating, water in this passage is part of recreating, and that ties at least in part to some science that we understand in theory is that the um, first biological life was in the water, amino acids and all that other kind of stuff were there, let there, let there be life in those ways, and then it grew into, um, if we think about evolution in those ways, life came from that. And God had his hands and all those things happening. It's the same way in Genesis. Other creatures are created before humanity is created. And that's, there is a, a I find a parallelism with evolution in the sense of what, what God was doing. Not in the way that Darwin talked about it exactly, but in the same sense that humanity is uh, is the um, is the end point of that. So on this in this season of Epiphany. I get in sort of in my concluding statements today, part of what the stories that we have um, on a Sunday reading are all about how this news of Jesus is spreading. And it's not the, the news of his birth that is spreading anymore. It's the news of his adult ministry. And it, it starts here at the River Jordan in this proclamation. Then other people come to find it. Sometimes it's the wedding of Canaan in Galilee where he's changing water into wine. Sometimes it's a Samaritan woman at the well, but all of our all of our gospel lessons are about the next group that comes to know. And sometimes it's meant to be the disciples learn first and then they pass it on. Sometimes it's outsiders, like the woman at the well in Samaria, outsider in that she was a Samaritan and not a Jew and that or Hebrew person in that sense of the word. And but God, Jesus is coming to to bring people back together and the circle gets wider and wider. More and more people get included as the good news spreads. Anything else on these lessons for today for us? All right, well, thank you as always. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, as always, for being part of this.